church. Good morning. Everybody doing well this morning? I'm doing pretty good. I, I'm, I've just got to tell you, though, that um, my, uh, my wife, well, she was a little bit sick yesterday, and she got right there, you know, in the belly where it's like, uh-oh, and then it went away. Uh, Jackson wasn't so lucky, and it uh, went the other way, and I'm right there right now. So one of two things is going to happen. We're either going to get to the end of this message, pardon me, but I'm, or I'm puking on that floor right there. <laughs> Either one could happen, so I'm just going to let you know in advance that that could happen, okay? But I am excited to be here this morning. Look forward every week to being here with you guys. I've come with some intention this morning, and uh, there's, I don't know if this is, can be you too, I've come with purpose in my presence. There's a reason why I'm here, and I desperately wanted to uh, let the Lord hear my voice telling him how wonderful he is, and praising him, and lifting him up, and telling him how much I need him and rejoicing about our future hope in heaven. And those are important to do that. I hope he's heard my voice this morning. And I definitely came with intention of hearing his voice as well, feeling his loving arms around me this morning. I hope that you feel the same way too. I hope that you've come with intention. And uh, the other thing that I came to do on purpose was to do my job. And my job is clearly defined in the scriptures, even though the pastor's job in America is a lot more vast than it is in other places in the world, probably to error, but uh, there's lots of things that pastors do. But there's one job that's definitely in the scriptures, and it says it in Ephesians chapter 4, that it's the, um, the leadership of the church, that it's their job to equip God's people. Raise your hand if you're God's people. Awesome, right? Go equip God's people to do God's work, right? What work? What is he, what is he, what is he doing? Well, I mean, what's our, what's our study about, right? Building a kingdom. That's what it's all about. He's, he's building a kingdom. Jesus said, I'm going to build my church, right? And he's, and he's brought you in, and you're his ambassador, and he's making his plea through you. You're, you're at work, right? You're to work on building his kingdom. And, and so um, to do that, there's lots of things pastors can do, you know, but... In the scriptures, it says in 2 Timothy 3.16 that all of what? This, right? All of scripture is inspired by God and useful to teach us and that God uses it, this, to equip his people for every good work. So it seems to go hand in hand, right? So what's the pastor's job predominantly? To preach the word, right? So anything that's going to happen as far as kingdom building, it should happen because this has informed you as to who you are, who he is, what he wants you to do, and inspire you to go do that. And so that's what I've decided I want to do here today. And I, So I'm going to do my job. And uh, so what's your job? You're supposed to listen, right? And then what? You're supposed to apply. You're supposed to do it, right? And what, well, here's the deal, though. I found, I'm reading this book that just started the other day from Francis Chan, Letters to the Church, or Letter to the Church Is. And, and he said something that I know and most pastors know, and we talk about it when we meet, and that is we find it very, very strange that every single week people show up in church. Most people don't show up every week, by the way. They show up every week or two or three. Some people do it every week. They show up and they listen to what's being said, but they just don't do it. And that seems kind of weird to me because if you're not going to do it, why are you here? Like There's other stuff you could be doing, but you come back because you know that it's good, you know that it's right, you know that you should, but you just don't do it. And, and the Bible talks about this, you know, James, the, 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 the book of James, it talks about that, like, he says that there, there, some of us are just hearers, right? And he says, but don't just be a hearer of the word, you know, that's like down here. This is entry level Christianity, right? To just be hearers of the word. But what does he want to do? He wants to move you on up, right? He wants to move you on up to not just hearers of the word down here, but to be doers of the word as well, because that's where the kingdom gets built in you and beyond, is in the doing of what you've heard, right? So when I was thinking about that, you know what came to my mind? The Jeffersons. I'm aging myself, but I was, yeah, moving on up, right? I want to move, I, God wants you to move on up from here, from just hearing it to doing it. I remember George and Wheezy, right? They were in a bad situation, 
But then they moved on up to something better. And God wants that for you. He wants to move you on up from down here just hearing to up here to doing. So why don't you do me a favor? Get up out of your seat. Come on, get up out of your seat. Look around. Pick three people right now. See them? Look around. Look around and go tell them that you're happy that they're here this morning. The church is better. And let them know. Look them in the face and tell them, listen, I'm moving on up. I'm moving on up. You guys ready to move on up? my buddy Kyle, our old worship leader there, I told him yesterday, the day, no, day before yesterday, that I was really looking forward to a Luminati's pizza, and I was going to get on a plane and fly up there, and he said, ha ha, and then yesterday he sent me a picture of the Luminati's pizza that he was crushing at his house last night for dinner. So I told him what every good pastor and friend should tell him, and that is, I hate you. <laughs> so anyway, hey, you guys ready to move on up to, to not just hearing, but to do? Okay, well, then we grab a copy of God's Word and, and turn to Acts chapter 5. That's where we are this morning. We left off at the end of chapter 4. We're just marching straight through the book of Acts. We find ourselves in Acts chapter 5. Of course, the book of Acts is the story of how followers of Jesus Christ have responded. And, of course, prescriptive, it should be for us how we should respond also uh, to who Jesus is and what he taught, okay, and in so doing, how the church would reach the ends of the earth as a result with the gospel of Christ. And so since we are called here at Revolution, we are called to be part of his redemptive story, we should be looking for truths that are shared in Acts chapter, f uh, well, not just five, but today in Acts chapter five, and then also embracing those truths as our own, and then sharing those truths with other people. And at the same time, we're looking for examples in the book of Acts that we could in turn follow. Because we see when, when they shared these truths in this way, you see what happened? It got to Leesburg. So it's effective, and we want to be effective in our endeavors too. And so we're looking for examples shown in the book of Acts that we could copy. Now, so far we've seen some very powerful preaching in the book of Acts, you know, Peter is preaching boldly, and, and that attracts people to the Lord, right? What, 3,000 people get saved the first day? That was pretty awesome. That attracts people. Um, the Holy Spirit shows up in a, in a powerful way, and it shakes the building, and the wind comes through, and the tongues of fire come down, and all the people are speaking in tongues, like they're speaking in the languages of all the people that showed up so they too could hear the gospel and believe and be saved. And so that, of course, attracts people to Jesus as well. Uh, the lame are healed. You know, that guy was sitting outside of the temple for decades, and, and Peter and John go up, and they heal him in the name of Jesus. And now he's in the temple, and he's dancing and singing before the Lord. And everyone's like, wow, I can't believe this. Like, that's drawing people to the Lord as well. And so the church is growing. These are all powerful things. These are all, I, I would say, these are all good things, right? Yeah. I think they're all good things. And it, they definitely draw people toward God and help grow the church. But then we get to Acts chapter 5. And things change a little bit. Things change a lot a bit. I would say that half of the chapter, you can go ahead and read it at your own speed, but half the chapter would probably still be in the good column, you know? Um, this healings in, in Acts chapter 5, would you say that's good? Thumbs up or thumbs down? That's good, right? 
Then, then it says that, that the disciples, they get, in, they get put in jail. That's kind of, eh, right? I don't want to be in jail. Anybody want to be in jail? Nobody really wants to be in jail, right? But then what's really cool, there's a big turn up of the thumb because even though they're in jail, the angels show up and break them free. So that's kind of awesome right there. So kind of, that's good. That draws people to the Lord. But the story that we're going to read, not so good. Not so good. Acts chapter 5, if you're right there with me, starting in verse 1, I'm going to read 1 through 11. You have a copy of God's word in front of you? Of course you do. That's a good church. (coughs) So the church, the context, the church has just started. People are feeling very, very generous. There's miracles being performed. They're meeting together. They're praising together. They're worshiping together, studying the, the apostles' doctrine. They're just, they're on fire for the Lord, right? Just awesome. And, it's, and, and, and chapter 4 ends with this dude, Joseph, who's like super generous. And he, and he sells his piece of land. Like that's not just what's in your pocket, right? He sells like a piece of land, and he sells it, and he brings the money to the apostles, to, and he just lays it at their feet. He doesn't say, uh, could you, here, hold on, let me see my offering envelope here. Uh, I'm giving you 20 bucks, but I need to make sure that 10 of it goes to a t-shirt, five of it goes to missions, and the other five, are the youth meeting this week? Okay, give them pizza. That doesn't happen, right? Because they realize that it's not their own. And so they lay it at the apostles' feet and say, hey, man, just give it to whoever needs it. And they walk away. Why is that in there? To give us an example of what real generosity looks like. Okay, so that's awesome, and we're all like, okay, I get that, I get that, I get that. And what is the first word of chapter 5? But, right? So we know there's something big that's going to change right here. Sometimes it goes from good to bad, and sometimes it goes from bad to good, but we know that something's going to change. So there's that one guy who does that generous thing, and then, but, there was a certain man named Ananias who, with his wife Sapphira, sold some property. He brought part of the money to the apostles, claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit, and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not sell, as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. See, he could have done whatever he wanted. God didn't say, you ha- just because Joseph sold the field and gave all the money, that doesn't mean you have to, okay? It doesn't mean you have to. You can, but you don't have to. You get to decide what you're going to do with your offering. When the baskets go around later, you get to decide. You get to talk to the Lord. Hey, what should I do here, God? And I'm, I'm going to respond accordingly. Like, like, and so what Mimi gives and what Joseph gives may be totally different. He might give a million dollars. She might give a nickel, and that's okay. If that's what we feel like the Lord wants us to do, that's cool. You can do whatever you want with it. But instead, he kind of pulled a little fib, didn't he? So he says, after selling the money, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this. You weren't lying to us, but to God. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Everyone who heard about it was terrified. Then some young men got up, wrapped him in a sheet, and took him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife comes in, not knowing what had happened. Peter asked her, was this the price you and your husband received for your land? Yes, she replied, that was the price. And Peter said, how could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this? The young men who buried your husband are just outside the door, and they will carry you out also. Instantly, she fell to the floor and died. When the young men came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear gripped the entire church and everyone else who heard what had happened. I thought the book of Acts was the story of how God builds his church. Welcome to revolution. You may die. (laughs) Fill out your connect card this morning. (laughs) So I'm thinking, man, I... 
I don't like this. Here's the thing about the Bible, though. This is so cool, right? Because this is the book. The book of Acts is the book of how God builds his church. There's no doubt. Can we all agree? It's in there. This is bad stuff, man. But the reason why it's, because it's in there, that makes it so legit. Because it, no one, who would, if you're making, if you were God and you're making up your own religion, I, I don't know about you, but hey, welcome to our church. You may die. I'm not going to put that on the billboard outside. Like, that's just not going to work, right? But yet, it's in there. But listen, when you study God's word, you should stop. Don't just read it, because when you just read it, it sounds like, man, this is a terrible story, man. God's mean, judgmental, I can't believe this. Like, a lot of people could respond a lot of different ways, right? But you've got to stop, and you've got to ponder this thing for a second. The Bible's accurate. Thank you. Let's try that again. The Bible's accurate. Thank you. But it's not exhaustive in that it doesn't ever, ever claim to tell you every single thing that happened back in the day. Like This is not a step-by-step, every single thing that ever happened documentation historical of what happened. It's not all in there, right? It's not all in there. For instance, like uh, I mentioned earlier on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit falls. People speaking in tongues. Peter preaches this dynamic sermon. And what happens? 3,000 people get saved, right? That's awesome. How many people got saved the next day? Well, we know the Bible says that each day the Lord added to the number being saved, so that's good, right? But how many people got saved the second day? I don't know. I don't know. How about when Jesus found out that his dear friend Lazarus, who he loved, was sick and dying. And he waits two days before he goes and says, wake up. What was Jesus doing during those two days? I, I, I don't know. I don't really know what he did during those two days. The Bible is not exhaustive. There's a lot of stuff that we don't know. That doesn't mean that they didn't happen. Things happened like crazy. But they don't all make the Bible. We just don't know. As a matter of fact, the gospel writer John, in his gospel, the fourth book of the New Testament, he shared this same truth towards the end of his gospel in John chapter 20. He says this in verse 30, The disciples saw Jesus do many other miraculous signs in addition to the ones recorded in this book. So there was other stuff, right? There's other stuff that happened back then, but it's not in the Bible. But look what it goes on to say. But these things that are written in this book are so that you may continue to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life by the power of his name. So listen, you don't know everything, but God has decided what you need to know to fulfill his plan and purpose. And with this in mind, you start realizing that this story in Acts chapter 5, as grim as it may be, this is the story that you absolutely need to know to accomplish his mission to build his church. He wants you to know about this because awesome things happened that didn't even make the Bible, but this one did. And so he wants you to know about it. So we all agree that this story is sort of awful, right? I mean, God just whacks two people because they do exactly what you and I do, right? They didn't kill anybody. They didn't kidnap any babies. They didn't burn down the temple. They were just a little greedy. They were a bit self-serving. And so to save face, they just told a little bit of a lie. And God killed them both on the spot. I probably wouldn't have put this into my holy book if I was writing it. It probably wouldn't have been what I did. And maybe I wouldn't have killed them. You know what I'm saying? Maybe I would have just reprimanded them a little bit if I was God. I don't know about you. But I don't know that I would have killed them. And I don't know that I would have put it in my holy book to attract people. I mean, killing Christians might not make people want to be a Christian. And, and please do me this favor. Don't tell me they weren't Christians. Okay? Don't tell me that they weren't Christians. I would just tell you this. You can't form 
in your own mind and decide what security looks like and what God's going to do. That's his job, okay? Now, I'm just telling you, some people would say, well, they weren't really Christians, they weren't really Christians, they weren't really Christians. If if you were a real Christian, God wouldn't smite you. Listen, listen, listen. First and foremost, the Bible never says that they weren't. But I think that it clearly says that they were. In the context of where we're reading in verse 32, it says that these two people were in the multitude of those who believed. That's what it says, okay? So the same evidence of you gathering here today that would indicate your faith in Christ is the same evidence for Ananias and Sapphira's faith in Christ. So don't be so quick to say that they weren't Christians. I say that they are. You can say what you want, but I would say don't be in a hurry to say that they weren't. God would never do that to them. Listen, Jesus is on a mission for his own glory to build his church. And he found it necessary to do this and to make sure that we all know about it. It made his book. So when you know this, two questions popped into my mind. I don't know if they pop into your mind, but let's, let's ask these two questions and look in the scriptures to find the, the answers. First of all, why did God do this? Why did God do this? And the second question is, why does it work? He's trying to build a church, right? Why did he do this? Why does it work? Why would this event make the church actually grow? And I want to get the the answers to those two questions in Scripture, okay? Now, before we chase down those answers, I want to address something that I believe that the text addresses clearly, and I don't think that... I think I would be negligent if I didn't stop and, and talk about this before we go into answering those two questions. I want to talk a little bit about the Holy Spirit, okay? I want to talk about the Holy Spirit. Here's the deal with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the most, he's the greatest mystery in the church, and he's the cause of the most division in the church of Jesus Christ. And I would say that that is foolishness, right? God should not cause us like he can cause us to be divided from the rest of the world that's not a believer like i get that we're different but within the body of christ the the bride that he died to form within that there should be no division caused by the holy spirit and but this is what happens with the holy spirit maybe you guys have experienced this so there's some churches that that's all they talk about is the holy spirit that's it they talk about the holy spirit all day long pray to the Holy Spirit, talk about the Holy Spirit, teach about the Holy Spirit, and the only time they don't talk about the Holy Spirit is when they stop to talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit that he gives us. That's all they talk. And then, sometimes, even that goes totally left, looks crazy, and they start doing totally insane stuff that has nothing to do with the Holy Spirit, and they slap his name on it and say, there he is. And some of it, you guys have seen it on TV, I'm sure some of it is crazy, right? But here's what happens. People that are fearful that that crazy stuff could happen in their church, the stuff that's not legit, because there's some stuff that's like, whoa, and that is the Holy Spirit. But I'm talking about the crazy stuff, right? When you see people falling over and they're barking like dogs and jumping over the pews, howling at the wolf like wolves, like, what is this, right? And so people get so afraid, we're not going to let that stuff happen in my church. So instead of allowing the Holy Spirit to move, We just wholesale neglect of the Holy Spirit. We don't talk about him. We don't pray. We don't teach. We don't allow. We don't sense. We don't worship. We don't bow. We don't follow. Nothing, right? It's just wholesale neglect. Okay, both of those are wrong. Both of them are wrong. Let me share with you a little bit about the Holy Spirit. This is all from the scriptures. You can look it up. So the Holy Spirit, he convicts us of sin. Like, he convicts us of sin, and the greatest sin is that you don't have Jesus. Like, if you have not bowed the knee to the Lordship of Christ, like, that's your greatest sin. And it says that he convicts us of this. Like, he brings that to your attention. So, basically, it's this. Listen, you're broken, he says. You're broken, right? You need help. You're broken. He says he convicts us of sin and of God's righteousness. Listen, follow the path. You ready? You're broken, and you can't fix it. But God can. That's the righteousness of God. He can fix your problem that you cannot fix. He goes on, he says, he convicts of the world of sin, of God's righteousness, and of the coming judgment. So here's the path again. You're broken. And you can't fix yourself. 
but God can. And you need to do it now. Judgment's coming, right? So there's a sense of urgency that the Holy Spirit pours out into a heart. It says, listen, you're broken. Jesus can fix you. Do it now. Do it now. Right? This is what the Holy Spirit does. He also comforts us. When we're grieving, when we're hurt, when we're sad, when we're lonely, he comforts us. Right? He's the comforter. That's who he is. He leads us into all truth. He reminds us of Christ's words. He indwells the follower of Christ. He creates unity in the church as one body, one spirit, and one faith, right? One hope. He gives us spiritual gifts to, to all of us to build up his church, to make it bigger, make it stronger. He produces the righteous character of Christ in the Christian. Love, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self control and he empowers the believer for effective gospel ministry this is what the holy spirit does okay this is what he does but listen loved ones this is what he does but it's not who he is okay he's also not some force like star wars and he's also not some sideshow circus freak show that just only there to stir up hyper emotion in people. That's not who he is. Look back at the text. Look at verse 3. Look at it says. It says, you lied to the Holy Spirit. Right? You lied to the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 4, he said, you weren't lying to us, but to God. But to God. So the Holy Spirit is, finish my sentence, God. The Holy Spirit is God. Every bit as divine as the Father, every bit as, div as divine as the Son, Jesus Christ, right? Listen, let me ask you a question. You guys have heard of the Trinity, right? Yes. Who's the first person of the Trinity? The Father. Okay, who's the second person of the Trinity? So what's the third, what's the third person? The Where in the Bible does that little chart of authority and rank exist? God. No, it, you show it to me. I'll give you $1,000 right now. The three bear witness. But you tell me where the rank and privilege is in that chart. There isn't one. There isn't one. Okay? There isn't one at all. Okay? Jesus, listen, Jesus number two on the chart, right? When he gets saved, what happens? It says that the Holy Spirit led him out to the wilderness to be tempted, right? So how often does the boss give the subordinate permission to lead him? Unless he's not a subordinate, right? He's God. He is God. Now, the Holy Spirit is the one who convicts you, so you'll say yes to Jesus. Not to say yes to him, but to say yes to Jesus. But that doesn't lower or lessen his deity. The Holy Spirit is to be worshipped and followed because he is God. That's who the Holy Spirit is, okay? And I, 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 this is a long rabbit trail off the answer in these two questions. But these things, this is very, very important. Because proper perspective, proper view of who God is, is mandatory if God's church is to be built. Because we don't want to build anything else other than Christ's church, correct? And the church that's all about the Holy Spirit is wrong in its practice. And the church that's totally neglecting or ignoring or lowering the Holy Spirit is equally wrong. The Holy Spirit is God equal with and eternally existing with the Father and Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is God. Okay, we need to understand that. Are we good? Let's answer the two questions. Okay, here's the two questions. And the first question is, why does God do this? Well, why does God kill these people? And then why is it in the book, right? Why is it in the book? So why did God do this? Why did he do this? Okay, so if you look back in the text, if you look back in Acts chapter 5, if you see when Ananias comes in, the husband, when he comes into the room and he's asked the questions and stuff like that, and he, and he dies, you see in verse 5 it says, and I, I quoted the I have two versions of the Bible, your Holman Christian Standard says that when he died, great fear came on all who heard about this, right? Great fear. The New Living Translation translates this great fear into terrified, okay? Terrified. Um, and then again, when Sapphira dies... You see the response in verse 11. 
It says also, great fear came on the whole church and on all who heard it. So all f- great fear, terror fell upon all the Christians and all the non-Christians alike. Just the people in town, those, they were just kind of here in Jerusalem hearing about all this kind of stuff that's going on. Great fear. So, so why did God do this? Fear. Fear. To create great fear, right? It's the word phobos. It's in Greek. It means this. Alarm. Fright. Exceeding fear and terror. See, a lot of people talk about the fear of the Lord as in just like reverence. Like I, I was at the um, I was at the, the the county commissioner's office last week to open it up in prayer for the for the county, you know. And and I hate when they do this, but they call it, they refer to me as reverend. I'm so not. But I understand, you know, so a reverend, uh, there's other people that are reverends. I don't want to be a reverend. I'm just Moses, right? But, but, but I understand, like, reverend is someone to be respected. You know, maybe he's got some wisdom. You know, all that kind of stuff. But, like, I stood up there like I'm staring, standing up here right now. How many people here are, like, afraid of me? No one. Nobody's afraid of me, right? I appreciate that a girl is the one who responded nobody. That's awesome, right? Even a girl's not afraid of me. That's awesome. But, but, but you're not afraid of me, right? So th- it, this is not just like reverence, like respect. He's got some authority, like that. Maybe your boss at work, kind of a reverence thing. No, no. This is alarm. This is fright. This is exceeding fear or terror. It's the word phobos. It's, the word, it's where we get the word phobia. Anybody in this room have a phobia? You can admit, maybe. I, I do. I have aquaphobia. Like I'm totally petrified of water. I, got an, I could drink it. Like, that doesn't bother me. But you guys would laugh. This is, I don't even know why I'm going to say this. I was going to say you'd laugh if you saw me in the shower. That's wrong. <laughs> but you would laugh if you saw me in the shower for this reason. Because when all the rest of you weird people are going, <laughs> like, and you love it, the soap, and you're going, oh, it feels so good, right? I'm like this. And then when I want to wash my face, I go like this. Because I can't stand water, right? Uh, and it doesn't just, like, bother me a little bit. I'm petrified of it, right? Right? Does anyone have a phobia? Right? It's not like, it's not like just a gentle little, eh, you know, this kind of bothers me. No, you're frightened of it. Right? It just bothers you, right? How many people um, have gotten a shot in their life, a, a needle? Anyone? Right? When it's all said and done, after the shot's done, did it really hurt? No. Not really. I mean, really, right? You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not, it's not nearly as bad as we think it's going to be, right? It's like that. But how many people, honestly, in this room, when you go to get a shot, you're hyperventilating, you just want to pass out? I do pass out. <laughs> I do pass out, right? <laughs> right? We're scared of a little thing that's no more painful than that. You know what I'm saying? Right. It, listen, it's not just a gentle little uneasiness. No, it's a fear. Like, I'm afraid of this. This word phobos is the same word that Paul uses in Romans 3.18 to explain why the entire human race is so broken. In Romans 3, I'm just going to read a little bit to you here. It says that... Um, In verse 10, as the scriptures say, no one is righteous, not even one. No one is truly wise. No one is seeking God. All have turned away. All have become useless. No one does good. Not a single one. Their talk is foul, like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with lies. Snake venom drips from their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. They rush to commit murder. Destruction and misery always follow them. They don't know where to find peace. Brokenness, right? Next verse. They have no fear of God at all. They have no fear of God at all. That's the problem. It's the same, phobos is the same word used in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. You can turn there if you want, just so you can lay your eyes on God's word, not just listening to me. It's how Paul explains how we should be transformed into more Christ-like people. 2 Corinthians 7, 
1 says this, because we have these promises, and so the context you'll see just above that in verse 6, God's made some promises to, to his believers. And he says, because we have these promises, dear friends, let us cleanse ourselves from everything that can defile our body or spirit. Is that good advice? Get rid of the bad stuff, right? Just get rid of it. Dump it. It's not helping you. It's not helping to form righteousness in you. It's not helping the people around you. It's not helping your company. It's not helping your church. It's not helping your family. It's not helping you. Get rid of all this. And let us work toward complete holiness, right? Get rid of the bad stuff, and let's get on the good stuff, right? Why? He says, because we fear God. What's the motivation for change in the life of the believer, as Paul states it here? Because of the fear of God. Should we be motivated because of the love of God? Absolutely. But not to the, to, the, to, the, to the neglect of the fear of God. And we shouldn't just let the fear of God motivate us to the neglect of God's love for us. Michael preached about God's love last week. Knocked it out of the park. All true, challenging, inspiring, awesome truth shared. But you can't neglect the fear of the Lord as well. Healthy fear is this. I jot this down. You might want to jot it down. It might be helpful for you. Put it in your notes. Healthy fear is, is, is having the knowledge of who God really is and then taking the feelings that that conjures up inside of you and taking all of that that accompanies that knowledge and let it put you in proper position with the fear source. Does that make sense? If you really know who God is, you know what you're going to do? Bow. When you know who God really is, it'll bring you to your knees. It'll cause you to bow. It stirs up fear. Jesus Christ, if you think that, you know, only the fear of the Lord is an Old Testament thing, just in case you're wondering, Jesus himself in Matthew 10, 28 uses the, this word phobeo, which is the same root word and if you look up the definition, it includes all the, def the, the, the definition of phob uh, phobos, but it also includes reverence and awe, right? Reverence and awe, but not to the neglect of extreme fear and terror. It's all of that. He uses an even more complete word. He says in Matthew 10, 28, don't be afraid of those who can kill your body. In other words, don't be afraid of, of like, like the reverend. Don't be afraid of the reverend. Don't be afraid of people, right? Don't be afraid of people. This is going to be bold, but listen. They cannot touch your soul. Fear, phobeo, fear only God who can destroy both soul and body in hell. This is very, very bold. It's very, very rough. But we want to serve you a well-balanced diet here at church. And so God is absolutely what Michael taught last week. He is love, and he does love you with an everlasting love. But it's also this. It's also this. And you can't neglect the fear, the terror, the reverence, and the awe of God. God teaches us in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, that he wants to transform us by the renewing of our mind, right? And the New Living Translation makes it pretty clear. He says, by changing the way that we think, right? And so when Michael preached about God's love last week, right, did, we, did you guys embrace that as, as good and true? Did you? I hope, I hope that you did. Not, not for his praise. He doesn't want it and doesn't deserve it. He's just a servant doing his duty. But did you embrace the fact that God loves you? Does that make you feel good, right? Do you? See, when you preach about God's love, you're not going to get a whole lot of pushback. Unless someone's having a really rotten day or a really rotten season, most people that come to church, they're going to hear this message about how God loves them, and they're gonna, there's not going to be any pushback there, right? You're not going to have too many people going, oh, he loves us? I don't like that. You're not going to get that too much. But fear of the Lord, exceeding fright, alarm, terror, awe, we don't want that. And listen, church, we don't have it. We don't want it, and so we shut it out. And we don't have it as a people. But to be in proper relationship with the Lord 
and to advance his kingdom to the ends of the earth, we need to change the way we think about the fear of God. Okay? And this is where we get the second question answered. The first question is, why do you do it? Fear. It caused fear to stir up. But the second question is, why does the fear of God work? Why does a proper fear of God instilled in God's people advance God's purposes? I'll tell you why. Because the fear of God is good. And the fear of God brings good to his people. That's why. And that's not taught too often, but I'm going to show you in the scriptures what I'm talking about. doesn't matter. What does my opinion mean? Nothing. Okay? My opinion means nothing, and I can get beat up by a girl. I love coming to church. <laughs> Here it is. You ready? Here's a list. Here's a list. Okay? See that list? I can give you 15 more. And I'm thinking maybe this week, during the week, I'm going to put them all on paper and have them for you next week. But here's just a short list of the fear of God. I want to start in Proverbs 9.10. Okay? Proverbs 9.10 says this, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Okay, so in other words, listen, listen. You, if you want to be, who wants to be smart in here? Anybody want to be smart? I want to be smart. Right? I want to learn some things. I want to know some things. Right? You can't learn anything unless you get this. Right? It starts here. Without the fear of God, you can't gain wisdom. It's the beginning of wisdom. All, all brains, all, all, all smarts, all wisdom. Like You've got to have this first. You've got to have a proper position with you and God. You've got to know he's high and lifted up and powerful, and you're not. You've got to know that first, okay? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Here's another one, Proverbs 8, 12 through 13. Here's wisdom speaking, personified, right? It's a personification. This is when, 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 when something that's not human has human qualities. It's in the scripture. It says, I, wisdom, capital W. It's like it's a person, right? And so God has created wisdom, and so now wisdom is actually speaking to you, okay? I, wisdom, live together with good judgment. Anyone want that? I want wisdom. I want good judgment. He says this, I know where to discover knowledge. I want that too, right? And discernment. I want that. You guys all want, I want all that for you guys. And immediately after he says this, he's like, this is what I got. And this is, I know where to find it. And the very next thing out of wisdom's mouth is this. I could have said a lot of things, right? All who fear the Lord will hate evil. All who, that's the motivator for, for avoiding, for, I don't want evil in my life. I don't, want to, I don't want any part of that. I don't want to be a part, I don't want to do that. I don't want that, right? And the motivator for that is the fear of God. I don't, listen, when you know, when you understand Ananias and Sapphira, right? When you understand the God that interacted with him and you're about to do wrong, you're like, I don't want any part of that, right? I don't want any part of that. All those who fear the Lord will hate evil. How about this one? Proverbs 10, 27. Fear of the Lord lengthens one's life. I was thinking about that. You know, there's obviously some eternal things there, right? You know, you fear the Lord, you say yes to Jesus. You know, I know I'm a sinner, I need his righteousness, judgment is coming, I bow to Jesus. Like, that's going to prolong your life, isn't it? Forever. But how about in this life? How many people want to jump into a shark tank? Right? Nobody wants to jump into a shark tank. Why? Is it because you have, because there's reverence for the shark? Do you have reverence for the shark, Steve? You have fear, right? It scares the crap out of you. I'm afraid of water to begin with. I wouldn't even jump in with a, with a, with a goldfish. Like Nemo scares me, right? But, but the thing, right, what, what is it that keeps you out of the water when you know, okay, listen, there's a, there's a shark warning at Daytona Beach today. Hey, let's go swimming. Who's doing that? Nobody, right? Why? Because you're not just, it, yeah, you're afraid of it. Like, and when you're afraid of a great white shark, it's not like, ah, eh, you know, ah, right? I'm scared. That's fear. That's fear. It can prolong your life for sure. In, in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, it's uh, two words are used. They're the equivalent of the New Testament Greek word for fear. It's uh, yare or yira. Um, but they're the same thing, the same definition. Uh, here's another one, Proverbs 14, 26. Those who fear the Lord are secure and have strong confidence. It's when Jesus says, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Like, I'm the boss. 
And so when I tell you, you can go make disciples and preach my word boldly, you can be secure and confident. No one's going to mess with you. They mess with you, they mess with me, right? They mess with me. It's, 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 it's like if I'm going to a fight, I'm, I'm probably going to take him, him, and Herb, right? You mess with me, you're messing with them, the big guys, right? And that's what God is. He's the biggest guy. And so you have confidence and you're secure when you fear only the Lord. Proverbs 15, 33, fear of the Lord teaches wisdom. Humility precedes honor. Listen, God's only going to lift you up when you learn to bow down humbly before him in fear. That's when he lifts you up. Proverbs 16, 6 is very similar to Proverbs 8, 12 through 13. And when God repeats something in the scripture, it's not because he forgot, it's because you did. Proverbs 16, 6 says, by fearing the Lord... People avoid evil. Remember Paul, who's definitely going to be in glory when you get there, right? He said, woe to me if I don't preach the gospel, right? Woe to me. He knows there's some consequences coming from daddy if I don't do what I'm told. And we know he's glory bound, but there's something about, he had the fear of the Lord. Woe to me if I don't preach, right? He had the fear of the Lord down pat. <clears throat> Proverbs 19, 23. The fear of the Lord leads to life. One will sleep at night without danger. Right? When you fear only, like Jesus said, fear only the Lord. What happens when you fear only the Lord? You can rest. Like if you knew the boogeyman was in the other room, you wouldn't rest, right? But when you know that only God should be feared, you can lay in bed at night thinking, man, it doesn't even matter what happens. I'm good. No, nothing can, they might kill my body, but they can't touch my soul. And so you sleep well at night. He gives rest to those that he loves. Here's another one, and, and there's a lot of, I don't know, I don't like the teaching that surrounds this, but that, well, we're going to address this. Proverbs 23, 17 says, don't envy sinners, for sure. That's good advice. But always continue to fear the Lord. You will be rewarded for this. Has anyone ever sat in church and they were taught that fear of the Lord is a great place to start, but it should graduate to the love of the Lord? Has you ever heard that? Yes. Yeah. I'm not picking on any denomination, but I started out in a Baptist church and that was taught all the time. It should start with the fear of the Lord. It's kind of like that whole Old Testament, and then the Old Testament doesn't matter anymore, so now we just go with the New Testament. And so back then it was like smiting and, and wrath and law, and that's who that God was. But then he graduated, and he became Jesus. And everyone's happy, and it's just grace and love, right? God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change, right? And so I was taught that when you first get started... The fear of the Lord should be your motivator to pursue Christ and to live a holy life and be pure and not sin and all that. Fear! But at some point, the love of God should take over and that should become your motivator. See, I heard that time and time again. But I have a problem with that. Well, actually, you know what? I don't really have a problem with that. I think God has a problem with that. Proverbs 23, 17 again. Don't envy sinners, but always continue to fear the Lord. Right? Always continue. And then look, you will be rewarded for this. Anyone want reward from God? I do. I don't even know what it is yet, but I know it's going to be good. It's going to be better than anything y'all can give me. Right? So continue to fear the Lord always. Here's, here's a, a, the last one, Ecclesiastes 12, 13. So, so here's Solomon who wrote much of Proverbs, and he wrote, Ecclesiastes, super smart guy, super rich guy, successful guy in every tangible way. And he says this. When all has been heard, like when it's all said and done, when you could say this and you could say that and everyone's an expert and everyone's got their opinion, he says, but when all has been heard, the conclusion of the matter is this. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is for all Humanity, right? That kind of transcends time, doesn't it? 
It goes beyond Old Testament, New Testament, America, Russia, Germany, Israel, Iraq, whatever, right? Left, right, Democrat, Republican, everyone. It's for all humanity. This is what you should do. Forget everything else. Listen, 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 listen. Fear God and keep his commandments. That's what you should do. Forever. And you'll be rewarded. That's why Paul tells us in Philippians 2.12 to work out your own salvation with fear. What's the next word? Trembling. Trembling. Right? Do you tremble before someone you just revere? Who trembles before someone that you just respect, you know? Billy Graham walks into the room. You know, he's not alive now, but if he walked into the room, would you tremble? I wouldn't tremble. I'd, 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 I'd respect him. I'd shake his hand. I'd thank him for being here. President walks in, same thing. Queen of, Queen of, of England, whatever. I, I would do that, but I'm not going to tremble before them, right? <laughs> right? But God is to be feared. He's the one who spoke in the planet's came out of his mouth at 186,000 miles per second. He's the one who opened the Red Sea. He's the one who killed Ananias and Sapphira on the spot for lying to him. That's who he is. We need a transformation in the way we think about the fear of God. So as we uh, land this plane here this morning on sharing God's word, I just want to say that if we're going to advance a kingdom of a king, of the king, then we need a proper view of this king, okay? He's, he's not our homie. He's not the big guy upstairs. He's the God. The God, God is the one who merely spoke and the universe came to be. God is the one who opened the Red Sea. God is the one who also brought drought and famine and, and oppression to his own that seek after false gods. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so since the fear of the Lord should continue forever, he then acted boldly and consistently within his character with Ananias and Sapphira. And he made sure that we all know about this so we too could fear him forever. And it's this king that we bow before. It's this king that we serve. It's this king that we worship, and it's this kingdom, by God's grace, we would build. Amen? Amen. Let's bow before him now. Let's bow. And maybe, you're, maybe you can, I don't know, if you want to, you can hit a knee, you can put your head down, you can do whatever you want, just as a sign of proper position with him. Bible says we can approach him with confidence because of Jesus. God help us for deciding who you are forming you in our own image creating a theology that allows for our sin the one who's high and lifted up if you were to show up here this morning some tangible way that we could see no doubt we would fall to our face we know that you love us but you're not our home you're our God Lord, whatever we've 
established in our own mind as to who you really are, if it doesn't line up with the way you have disclosed your person in your word, then Lord, I ask that you'd forgive us of this and transform our mind. Help us to have a proper view of who you are. I'm not asking you to create a fear in us. I'm asking you to help us know who you really are. We all take you too lightly. Myself included. Son and Holy Spirit. Spirit, Son, Father. God, we're your people. And even though most of us don't follow you the way we should, we're asking, Lord, that you'd speak to us again now us how we could partner with you <coughs> to advance your kingdom in our city. Your word tells us that it's your desire that all are saved and come to an understanding of the truth and that we are your ambassadors. We agree with you, Lord. We want everyone in our cities here locally to be saved and to come to an understanding of the truth. And we want you to use us to, to accomplish this. And so, Lord, I pray that you would speak to your people afresh and let them know how they could give. practical expression of love to this community saying thank you to you for all that you've done for us and then using all that you gave us to advance your purposes not withholding not greedy not self-serving but open handed speak to us now in Jesus name